Welcome to our continued study on, on the book of James. Um, we actually made it through chapter 1 and we're beginning James chapter 2 and we're going to go from verse 1 to 13. Let's begin. My brothers and sisters, believers in our Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet, have you not discriminated amongst yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Wow, isn't it amazing how some things between the early church and today really have not changed much at all? Favoritism is, well, a polite way of stating discrimination and prejudice. And remember, James wasn't talking to the world. He was talking to his church, to a church, to Christians, to you and to me. Wait, not me. I, I, I have no discrimination. All I can say is, well, that's wonderful. Mm, doubtful, but wonderful. You see, we have in our human nature that, that um, this, this thing where we have sin that, that just drives us sometimes to have beliefs and thoughts and actions that are not what God desires for us. So we have to fight that sin nature. And while I admit um, there, are, um, there are much better than, than people and relationships and prejudice and discrimination are better than when I grew up, they are still not like, praise God, what they will be in heaven. You know, I didn't go to church, so I really didn't learn much from church. My lessons were learned from my home and were learned from my community. My dad worked in insurance, and I remember this about him. He died when I was young, but, but I still remember that um, color, race, wealth, or not wealth, um, they didn't matter to him. I remember him treating all people equally. As a teenager, my mom spent a lot of time in the hospital and I spent a lot of time alone. I was allowed with permission to have someone spend the um, night with me on weekends. And I remember my mom asking me one time who spent the night and I gave a name. It was an unusual name. What kind of name is that? Who is this person? And I mentioned that he was a person of color. And boy, my mom, she was so upset. She said, what would the neighbors say? She couldn't believe that I had a person of color in my house. Blah, 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 blah. It was, it was a, almost like a mortal sin. Well, my community, I didn't learn a whole lot there either. They were all white and middle class. Next town over, all black and lower middle class. And the two shall never meet. My point is that there is only one true way to remove the influence of discrimination, prejudice, and hate. That is removing the old nature of sin. And actually that nature, many, for many of us, the nature of upbringing. And the only answer, the only answer is Jesus. Jesus taught, and, 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 I, and I've seen several things as I've read through the scriptures about Jesus. First thing I've learned about Jesus is all appointments to Jesus were divine appointments. One that sticks out um, quickly in my mind is, is if you look at uh, John 4, 4, that divine appointment was with a woman from Samaria. John 4, 4 says, now we had to go through Samaria. Listen up. No Jew had to go through Samaria. In fact, the Jews would do all that they could to avoid Samaria. In fact, they considered these half-breed believers, but not Jesus. He knew that there was a hurting woman and a lost town. And it mattered not to him that he was Samaritan. Church, our prayer needs to be, Lord, give me a divine appointment each and every day. 
in all circumstances and situation and never, ever can color, race, poverty, none of that can matter. It is a divine appointment by the Lord. You know, Dale the other day was adding up how many divine appointments have been a part of our household. And I'm not talking about dinner. I'm not talking about a night or two. I'm talking about people who spent at least a week or more with us. And she counted over 60 divine appointments. By the way, one of those divine appointments led to the adoption of our son, Josh. I believe if you see, if you are open to see every appointment as a divine appointment, just like Jesus did, you can't discriminate. It's the Lord's guest in our lives. The second thing is I see that Jesus stood up for the less fortunate or those who were discriminated against and many times even hated. John 8, 1 through 11 tells a story that we've all heard. I'm just going to read a little bit of it, but it's about, the Jesus, it's about Jesus and the woman caught in adultery. Remember, they brought the woman um, where the man was, that's a different message in itself, but, but they brought the woman and, uh, and the Pharisees were so sure they could trap Jesus or he would come down hard on this. And they were just, they were, they were trying to trap him. And Jesus said this, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and he wrote on the ground. And then he straightened up and asked, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go and leave your life of sin. Even on the cross, Jesus ministered to the thief next to him on the cross. You know, I could go on and on. I could talk about Matthew, the tax collector. I could talk about the poor talk about the leper. I could talk about the leper when people, other people ran away, but Jesus ran towards even his first miracle, saving the bride and family from the embarrassment of running out of wine. Why were they going to run out? Because they probably didn't have the money to buy more. They were less fortunate. And the last thing I learned from Jesus is, and I love this, there was a comfort level, a comfort level of being with all people. Luke 5, 5 talks to us about someone we all know, Matthew, the tax collector. And it says in Luke 5, I'm sorry, in Luke 5, uh, verse 27, after this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi, Matthew, sitting by his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him, and Levi got up and left everything and followed him. Then he held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisee and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? You know, it is more than just our sin nature that causes us to have discrimination and prejudice. It's also ignorance. And it's too often based on just a lack of experience. I've been watching a series called The Chosen, and I absolutely love it. All Bible characters come to life. One in particular was Matthew or Levi. He was chosen by Rome to be tax collector because he was Jewish and he was amazing in math. I show in the show, I love how they show him as having Asperger's. In the chosen, he would also kind of sneak out of his house, hidden in a cart, and show up the collection booth because he didn't want anyone to know, one, where he lived, and two, how wealthy he was. To say he was despised is an absolute understatement. While everyone despised Matthew, Jesus called for Matthew to follow him. He became a disciple. Don't hide from peoples. Embrace reach out to all people. Verse five, going to verse seven. Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, God has not chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him. But you have dishonored the poor. Isn't that the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of to whom you belong? Ouch. 
Yeah. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but, but you know, it is a, it's a time for the church to reflect. You know, do we do as the world does? You know, we are wowed by the rich and famous. We, we are wowed by actors and actresses, musicians, athletes, corporate leaders, the rich and famous. I guess there is another benefit of being 65. I see clearly that so many times the rich and famous actually are just a smokescreen of hurt. Too often, it is the very same people who attack us as Christians. James says it. The ones dragging you into court and blaspheming the name of Jesus. Wow, that's, that's what's happening. I have to tell you a quick story. When I was uh, with Teen Challenge, I was the director of... Uh, of the center in uh, Tucson, Arizona. We ran a car wash and one day, a beautiful, expensive BMW came. It didn't even need a wash, it was brand new. And, and this guy was son of, you would know the act of a very well-known actor. He laid his wealth and fame on thick between, before all of us and when he left, guess what? He gave us a check, forget this, $5,000. Do you know how many months of car washes it would take to raise $5,000? Whoa, 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 Pastor, does this kind of go against everything you've said? Oh, wait, I forgot to tell you this. The check was on a closed account and was worthless. Enough said. Let's go on. Verse 8 to verse 13. If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. You shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. I'm going to add something. Mercy triumphs over judgment every time. Well, let's take a review of just a few of the facts in found in these verses 9 through 13. I'm going to specifically look at verse 9. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as law breakers. That's why James was not making this a suggestion. He knew if we show favoritism, a polite way, by the way, of saying discrimination at best, if not prejudice and we are convicted, convicted, found guilty of sin. And the sad part, discrimination and prejudice, think about it. It really takes a lifetime of building. And it's not easy. It, it's, I'll go one step further. Probably impossible in the flesh to stop. But James is telling us, it has to stop if it continues. If we even show favoritism in church, it's discrimination and we have failed and we have sinned. And Lord, forgive us. So the first thing we got to do as, as Christians is please allow it to go no further. No matter how you were raised, teach your children and your grandchildren, not only to love God, but to love who? All your neighbors. Doesn't matter. Race, color, none of it matters. Love all your neighbors. And secondly, since prejudice and discrimination are built through ignorance, you got to spend time with those who are less fortunate. You got to Learn to know your neighbors. If you are to love them, how can you love them if you don't know them? You have to know your neighbors. To know your neighbors, you need to be where all of your neighbors are. Spend time with the less fortunate. Spend time with those who are different than you. 
whether it is color, whether it's race or whether it's privilege. You know, when I went to Teen Challenge, I honestly had lived in this little bubble, this little white bubble, this little white pri privileged bubble. And I worked in Teen Challenge and boy, I work with people, so many people of different color, people of poverty, but you know what? It changed my life. Now, I have a comfort level with all people and I'm grateful for the divine appointment God gave me. Verse 13, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Remember, it is a sin. Or in Jesus' words in Matthew 7, 2, For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. We have to remember, it is a sin to discriminate. And if you live a life of discrimination, then that's how God is going to judge you. Let me close with this statement of James. I love it. I can't say it any better. Mercy triumphs over judgment every time. Lord, in my life, may I live in, 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 live in mercy and be directed by mercy. And with my dealings with others, may it be through a lens of mercy. May I treat other people as Jesus treated others and as I have been treated by Jesus. Thank you for our study tonight, verses 1 through 13, and let's close in prayer. Lord, we do pray that you will just touch our hearts. So many of us have been raised in a, in, in, with an attitude of discrimination, an attitude that we are better than other people. And, and I have been reminded so many times there, but by the grace of God go I. So, Lord, I pray that you will help me to realize every person is a divine appointment that comes across my path. And may I freely share the love of Jesus to all those you put my way. Lord, I just pray that instead of discrimination, that I will look at all my neighbors and love them all. But more than just loving them, do what I need to do, spend time with them. Thank you for James. We thank you for just his practical teaching. Lord, we pray just that, that you have put in our ears. May it just dwell in our hearts. And from our heart, just be a part of who we are in our life. In your wonderful name, amen.